Oh, I wish I got a coffee. I'll make one later. Little delay. Ch -ch I know there's a delay, but I'm going to start saying good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Good morning. All right. It's hard to measure that delay, but I think I'm there. Happy Tuesday. How are you? Good morning. Welcome to Ribbon Candy Hooking. Coffee time. Um, I just want to remind you, today is the 30th. I think there's one more day in March. Yeah, there is. On April 1st, I just want to remind you, we're going to run the show at noon, a little bit later. See how that goes. See if more people are able to come on at noon. Um, just doing it as an experiment because I know a lot of people are missing it who would like to be able to chime in live and be uh, more, more a part of it. So starting on April 1st, we're going to go to a noon show. Man, these glasses will not get clean. Well, good morning, everybody. Before I start saying good mornings, I just want to remind you um, that today we are going to be looking at, we're starting to look at, just scraping the surface of another great uh, historic book. Now, you know, if we were uh, fine artists or even woodworkers or bicyclists or whatever, we would have a huge uh, library of older books to pull from. With rug hooking, we don't have a ton of books. It is finite. It is not infinite. Uh, the, the number of nice old titles there are for reading. And I feel like on Friday, uh, we hit one with uh, Ella Bowles' book. Uh, this is another one for me that is really a standout. This is a 1953 book. We're going to come to this in a minute. I'm going to say all the good mornings. Choice Hooked Rugs by Stella Hay Rex. So we're going to be digging into this in just a minute, just scraping the surface. Um, but, you know, I can't say enough about these older books. You know, I feel like with rug hooking over the years, we have gotten into such weird pigeonholes with styles. Some people doing this style, some people doing that style. Um, this one, you know, liking this and then not understanding why this person would want to do this in terms of aesthetics. Um, so, you know, it, it's just, it's very nice to read these older books because it brings you back to a time in history, the earlier in middle 20th century, when people um, were more about getting started, getting going. This is how you do it. This is how you get the pa pattern. You're probably going to make your own pattern. Um, these are tips and tricks for doing that. Um, very sort of forthcoming, helpful. Uh, and it wasn't quite so persnickety and particular as it is now. So I like the feel and the atmosphere of these old books. And they're filled with unusual sort of curious type information, curiosities. So we're going to dig in there. We've got a bunch more. Luckily, there's a bunch more. And we can return to them over the years as we do coffee times and cocktail times, which reminds me, I hope that you saw that I posted last night. I went over to Michelle McRelly's just quickly the other day. She's had both of her shots. I've had one, so I had my mask on course. Um, but I'm going for a test on uh, Thursday so that I can be over her house on Friday night to do a live uh, cocktail show there. Now, you probably already know Michelle McCarelli because she's such a legend in rug hooking, but she's been in like every issue of rug hooking and celebration and all those things. Her rugs are just um, so stand out, so, so amazing. She's taught everywhere so often. She's such a She's such a, a distinctive person and character in rug hooking. She's such a lot of fun. She's a good friend of mine. Um, so I'm going to be over there. We're going to do like an evening of because she so often says when we're chatting, you know, she has so many stories that are associated with the rugs that she does. She has so many great family stories um, and just quirky stories, about traveling and things like that. So she always says that she has been dying to have an opportunity to look at some of her more famous rugs because there's a lot and um, tell the story, you know, the genesis of the rug, where she got the idea, what the hard parts were, where she made crucial decisions, you know, where she came to crossroads and impasses with the project, and um, mostly just storytelling, because that's something she's so good at. So I'll be over there on Friday night for cocktail time, and hopefully everything works technically, because her internet is quite good. So I'm assuming it's going to work. I promised her I'd bring over a giant, giant pitcher of booze, 
Um, that is a requirement so we can have some real fun. But it's going to be such a good episode. I know it's our typical uh, trivia night, so I'll shift that a little bit. But, uh, you know, she said, how about Friday? And I said, let's do it because both of our schedules get really busy and she's just been traveling and teaching and she just had her knee done and she's been out. She's just been MIA. So I thought, let's do it now. You're offering it. I'm taking. Let's do that now. So that's Friday night on Cocktail Night. And I also want to let you know, tomorrow is Zoom and the information to get on the Zoom call tomorrow, also at 1130, about 1130 to 1230. Sometimes we go a little bit longer. Um, that information is in the description of this video. And I will also post it on our Facebook page, which is Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club. I'm going to post it in both places. And I'll mark it as a header so you can find it uh, in either place before tomorrow. And I also want to mention something else fun now that the weather is getting to be so nice. On Thursday, so tomorrow is Zoom, the next one is Thursday, instead of returning to the Stella Hayrex book, Stella Hay, Stella Hayrex, um, I'm going to be doing that, I'm going to pick that up again next week, instead of returning to that Thursday, I am going over to Naugatuck, one town over, to visit with my friend Naomi, uh, whose company is Ravensgate Primitives, it's a rug hooking company, and she does, she has an Etsy store, I posted the link to that in this video, and I used one of her full rugs that's for sale as the thumbnail for this video, that's a for sale rug, that link to that is in the description to this video here, and I'm going to be going over there on Thursday and having coffee time in her place. She has a giant cheese shed in her yard where she has her uh, studio, her designs, her supplies. She sells stuff. She's got beautiful primitives. So I thought it'd be nice to do a live video over there for a coffee time where we can drink coffee, talk about her designs, talk about the things she sells, uh, talk about ideas. So it's going to be a busy week for us. It's going to be a big traveling week for us. So stick with me. We're going to do it all together. Kira, good morning. Good to see you. Me and Kira have been making plans to go to Booth Bay Harbor and do some stuff around the Cape together. It's so good to find a buddy who likes the same things, right? I don't have a lot of buddies who like rug hooking. Heather's one of my buddies that likes rug hooking. Of course, my mom. But I don't have a lot of buddies who like rug hooking that are close to me. And, and my buddies from kindergarten growing up, um, they like other things. So that's that's uh, it's always it's always nice to hang out with people who like the exact same thing and you have the same passions and your heart is in the same place and you're, you you want to do the same things just automatically. That's super. That's a super gift for anybody, right? Because um, I lived abroad for so long that you know, twelve or more years. Um, that was just the one time. There were many times before I lived abroad. But, you know, all those friends are there. So it's so nice, Kira, that we're making plans together. I'm super excited. I posted that link to the Magdalena Ebby Bryan because you know that's coming up. The Magdalena class is coming up. I'm going to announce that probably uh, today or tomorrow. I've got to just get the specifics down. But doing that whole Pennsylvania tour to me is so, so appealing. Um, I was going to do it the other day and went to Vermont instead the other weekend. Um, I feel like I need more time there to figure it all out and hit all the stops and do some antiquing. But um, that's coming up too. And I know that we are right. I mean, I watch MSNBC religiously and they are constantly talking about what's going on uh, in terms of health in the country. I don't want to say any keywords to flag this video. I'm well aware that we are at a crucial juncture. Uh, with being smart or being stupid. And if we're stupid, we're going to fall back into a horrible pit. Um, and I'm worried about that, the doom and the gloom, uh, you know, that keeps being reported. At the same time, I could see us, if things go well, in a couple of months, especially with the way vaccinations are going, doing adventures together. So my head is in that, and my head is glass half full. And I am thinking about planning things like the Pennsylvania things, and planning day trips, and even planning longer things with sprinters or renting a bus or something. I'm going to put all that to you soon. I don't want to shock you and do it too soon, but those things take time and planning. And remember, I was a tour guide for years. All of those things take a lot of time, but luckily those connections are still there. And on the horizon, there are some possibilities for us to do some great uh, rug-related, rugging and antiquing type mystery tours, things like that. Uh, all of that is on the horizon. So just keep, keep that there like a little seed that's about to grow. Um, and we're going to be, of course, we're going to be smart, but I am thinking and planning just the same. 
Martha, good morning. Good to see you. Happy coffee time. Thanks for the order. You chose another one of the alphabet, the Nancy Thomas alphabet patterns, which was beautiful, and the R carrot. So I've got the R carrot ready, and I'm going to work on the Nancy Thomas. I love, I love her designs. I love everything you choose. It's so specific what you choose. I'm getting such a feel for what you like. I, I just, I love your choices. Beverly, good morning on the Washington coast. Good to see you. Happy Tuesday. Linda, happy Tuesday. How are you? The, the sun is shining in the neighborhood. Isn't it nice? It feels great. I have one of these short sleeve LuLaRoe dresses on because I can put my giant bulk. I had macaroni and cheese for breakfast, so I can't complain about my weight because I'm not making good decisions. That's for sure. Sheila, good morning. Good to see you in Benton City, Washington. Crystal, good morning. Good to see you in Halifax. Glad you're there eating cookies and punching a rug. Well, you can afford to eat the cookies. I know that for sure. And that sounds so fun. I don't think I know what you're working on right now. I hope you post it soon. I haven't seen a post from you lately, so maybe I missed it. I'll have to, I'll have to check. Kaz, you're on this morning. Great to see you. I hope you're having a good break. It's nice that you're able to be on. It's nice to see your name there. I hope it's a really nice week that, that feels like it lasts forever for you. Robin, great to see you. Very windy in Wisconsin. It was an interesting dog walk this morning. Oh, man, I bet. Yeah, it's like a video game if there's flying projectiles and things like that to, to navigate. And Penny, good morning from sunny North Carolina this AM. Happy coffee time. Uh, Carol, good morning. Good to see you. Cynthia, good morning from South Texas. Good to see you. Kirsten, good morning. Sunny and bright in Vermont. Oh, don't make me get in the car. I'll get right in the car and take off. Good to see you. Linda, good morning in Massachusetts. Great to see you. And Amber, good morning to you. Janice, good morning from cold, windy, and snowy Minnesota. Oh, Janice, that one stands out. It's a stay inside day, day I guess, right? Dave, good morning. It feels like spring today. What a mixed bag, huh? Good to see you, Dave, in Toronto. Lisa, good to see you. Sun is shining in Pennsylvania. Heather, good morning. No, I'm glad you were hooking. You have been a house on fire in every department. You are doing amazing work right now. Um, my kids are on break next week, uh, Heather. I'm wondering if yours are. I wonder, you know, if it's just a universal thing or what. I heard from the kids they were on break. The school doesn't send anything anymore. You know, it's like the Bermuda Triangle of information. It's just like, oh, there's no school next week. You know, it'd be, it'd be nice to know these things, I guess. Mom, good to see you in Granby. Sunny and bright. We already talked on the phone. Talking on the phone from the Coles parking lot, waiting for them to open. Naomi. Oh, Naomi, good to see you. So we're going to go to Naomi's on Thursday. I'm super excited. I'm super excited. And I, again, I linked to the store. It's such a good store. Um, Ralda, good morning. Good to see you. Happy Tuesday. And Doreen, happy Tuesday. Good to see you. Debbie, can't wait to get back to Maine. Oh, me too. It's truth. It's the truth. It's so, it's, this is the time of the year that you, uh, that I long for that drive up Route 1 with all the antique stores where it gets all narrow and difficult and congested, but then you see all those lobster shacks on the side of the road and people standing in long, long lines waiting for them. And you do it too, just because you know it's going to be worth it. It wastes time from antiquing, but it is what it is. Uh, it is such a gorgeous state. I absolutely love Maine. I would switch that for Connecticut in a second. Sue's good to see you. You're in Kansas. I hope you're getting good weather there. Oh, everybody, everybody wants to visit everybody else. We're just going to have to take a bus and do like the Beatles magical mystery tour. Kira, Sue's Linda. Linda Jacobs, good morning. Sun is shining, but it's chilly. Sounds like fun. Yeah, it, you know, it is chilly, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Captain of Caramel. Yep, that's the pattern you got, Martha. Captain of Caramel. That is really cool. Looking forward to... Yeah, you have Captain of Caramel and you ordered Mistress of Muffins. What strange words I'm saying. <laughs> they are such... It's the Nancy Thomas alphabet. Remember I did a, an alphabet night that when I introduced the alphabet soup pattern, one of our cocktail nights, it was super fun. Sharon, good to see you with both of your shots all set. Oh, I'm so glad. So glad. Well, it's good to see everybody, always, always is. And we have such a busy week coming up. It's, um, it's exciting. 
It's really exciting. I feel like going out and visiting people. I'm also going to write to Haley at Loop by Loop because she's one of my buddies too. See if um, what they're doing with shots and everything over there, and if it's possible maybe to go to her studio and do a video again. I did a tour there, but I'd love to sit there and do coffee time and chat with her and see what her new designs are for this year. Everybody that I can get to that does hooking, we all have to get together and just do stuff together so that we can see what everybody else is working on. Last night I was working on dyeing, you know, because um, the punch needles are coming, I think, today. So those were on pre-order. Everybody who ordered one of those punch needles, I'll talk a lot more about those. But those are the uh, more inexpensive, but I think just as good as anything, uh, finer punch needle. And they take the number two ply Briggs and Little. So I took 16 skeins of my um, Briggs and Little. I'll show you tomorrow because if I show you the yarns drying, you will see... Uh, the hoarder's paradise that is surrounding me and you will call the police I'm afraid and report me for being such a terrible pig so I will show you tomorrow those colors but it's got a farmer's market theme with like fruit and vegetable colors and I think it's really good I'm putting together some patterns that will be ready certainly before International Hooking Day um, and I ordered a ton I ordered a wholesale bunch of the Susan Bates hoopla non-slip hoops um, I think that either the 8 inch or the 10 inch to put in with all of the punch kits that people are uh, ordering or pre-ordering uh, and they will all come with a design that I have yet to show one it's a choice of course but um, those kits are going to be a very high quality kit for the money in terms of having a very functional needle a really good beginner's hoop and you know once you know whether you like it or not then you upgrade piece by piece you get the Oxford um, needle or you get a, a frame you do something different but to get started it's going to be it's going to be the best starter kit that I've seen I'm real happy with the way it's coming together April good to see you good to see you Jill great to see you too Oh, Jill. Jill gave me some great bo uh, book recommendations. I've been listening to the audiobooks that you can listen to through the library. You probably know this, but you don't have to actually go to the library to take them out. You can download listening books. My library allows for two uh, a month, but I think during the last year they've allowed like infinite because they never seem to get shut off, um, which is a good problem. Um, but Jill recommended, what was it, Luann Lou Lou Rice, something like that? Uh, and I listened to, I think it was um, Summer of Roses or something. It was one of the best books I've ever listened to. I was crying halfway, you know, th through half of it in a good way. It was so good. So I'm ready to listen to some more. That was a great, um, that was a great recommendation. Oh, you've got your Simone uh, Vajavodin book. That's great. Yeah, that is a really great book. You have a commission of a modern mid-century pillow for a friend who just redid her whole house in that style. Mid-century modern, that's the thing these days, isn't it? Ooh, how fun to have a commission. Good luck with that. I'm sure you're going to crush it, meaning do really, really well with it. Um, oh, one more thing I want to show you before I do commentary. Um, I, I put out a free pattern today, and the link to that is in the description. I want to be sure that everybody has, you know, if you celebrate Easter or at least springtime, I wanted to be sure that everybody, regardless of what's going on with money and time and budgets and all that stuff, I wanted to be sure that everybody had an Easter pattern that you could work on if you wanted to this weekend. So I put a free pattern out. It's a design that I drew last year, and it's cleaned up for the Internet. This was the drawing I did. It's actually, I, I got rid of the, the um, edges. It's just in a, in a rectangle. Uh, so it's, the drawing's all cleaned up, but this is the original drawing that I did. So this is all cleaned up and available um, as a free download on Ribbon Candy Hooking, but the link is in here. It's of like a woman in period-style dress with kind of like, um, the the um, sort of restoration style, giant sleeves and large skirt. And then I did kind of circles in the trees. I mimicked the circle in her bun, circle on her sleeves, and all the eggs. And of course, you could do the eggs differently. I put a bunny on this one and some stripies on this one. Uh, and I did kind of the um, concentric circle-y bushes and trees. But you could take out your Sharpie, as I always say, and add stuff to this pattern. But it's there for you, and you can make it any size you want. Uh, but it's there for you. If you're looking for a nice pattern to do for Easter weekend and you haven't thought of it and you're just thinking of it now, you can download this and if you have the means to transfer it, you can just get going with that. Something nice and something free. I wanted to be sure I put something out there. Um, is this in my, yeah, that's the thing about this shot, right? The, your arm is, at least for me, I know each person is different, but my arm was sore, not even for a whole day. It was really pronounced, but not even for a whole day. It was remarkable how quickly... Uh, that passed. I wish everything passed like that. So, all right, great. Well, you know what? Let's look at this book for a few minutes. I'm sure I'm going to run over again. Choice, ho choice hooked rugs. Um, we don't even use the word choice in that context anymore, do we? But um, this is just a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous book. 
You know, one thing I will say, this is the book I was telling you about yesterday, um, you know, with the funny chapters that we'll get to next week, like uh, Men Are Perfectionists and Original Rugs by Men, Husband and Wife Teams, Cape Cod Rugs, Church Rugs, Early Rugs, Pennsylvania Dutch Rugs, so many chapters that we have to look forward to. But I will say at the beginning of this book, the first chapters are what makes a good rug. So that's going to be um, thoughts and notes on composition and design. Um, she doesn't talk a lot about actually hooking, right? Rugs of this period, they assume you know, here's the fabric, here's the hook, here's the material, you're pulling it through, figure it out. That's, this is the sort of, um, this is the starting approach uh, in this era. They're not giving you, um, oh, I'm glad you like it. I'm glad you like it. I hope some people like that pattern. It's, you know, I don't love it, I have to say. I used to draw a lot of costume stuff because, you know, I have a costume degree and I worked in the theater in London when I was younger in my 20s. Um, and, you know, I drew so many costumes back then and I sewed so many costumes back then. And it's very easy for me to draw characters like this. It, it's very second nature because this is like, this has been my style all growing up was doing stuff like this. But um, it reminds me of those days and those were hard days. Those were hard days sleeping on the floor of a wardrobe, waiting for the matinee in the morning and waiting for clothes to come out of the washer so I could iron for four hours before the show. Those were hard days. So I do these sort of costume driven things and, and I do them and then I'll give them to you because they don't do much for me other than bring back a lot of really bad memories. Memories of a lack of sleep, hangovers and just wearing wet moldy clothes because I could never stand around long enough to get my own clothes dry. Beats the alternative, yeah. So anyway, so the beginning of this book um, is very technical. What makes a good rug? Design. Really, really good tips, too, um, for, for the layman, right? It is, these are not going to be for people who have a, a certification as a teacher. These are for everybody. These are just general composition and design tips that she's giving, lots of them. Um, geometrics and quilt patterns, color, dyeing, textures and materials. And then she kind of builds up a chapter on flowers, a chapter on leaves, a chapter on backgrounds. The beginning of the book is, thanks mom, please do give a thumbs up. The beginning of the book is, um, is all about, remember what we were saying yesterday, getting your head into it, thinking it through, before, just sitting, thinking it through first. Sometimes when you just race to the project and, and start hooking, you end up pulling the whole thing out. This is about getting your head into initially your design. And she's giving you so many ideas for creating your own design that are very, very easy. And in the first chapter on design, she talks about um, basic shapes, right? I've never seen in a rug hooking book somebody talk about uh, breakdown shapes and the history of shapes to this kind of detail. I'm not being sarcastic or uh, ironic at all. It's very interesting and it's very useful. It reads like a history book. It's a big book. So she talks about um, curved lines. I skipped over the first uh, 12 pages and she's talking about curved lines. And she says some really uh, interesting things like the curved line, this is a subchapter. The circle in itself belongs in the category of static design because it leads nowhere. Now that is interesting, isn't it? Thinking of a circle as a static design. It, it, that is a super interesting twist, especially if you design yourself. Um, she's right. It's a closed design. It can't go in many directions. It can, it can, it can um, stretch into an oval, but that's about it. That's about all a circle is going to do. It's very static as opposed to marble cake background, like lightning background, crazy wild striping. Um, you know, it's very different, isn't it? It's a, the polar opposite of a lot of rug hooking styles that are much looser. A circle leads nowhere. It's static. But when the circle is broken down into a reverse curve, we get a continuity of movement. The reverse or S curve, universally recognized as the most graceful form in art, offers a varied possibilities as the basis for a scroll. Observe the rhythm patterns. Now this seems to be a thing in the 50s, rhythm patterns. Observe the rhythm patterns taken from old Japanese prints on the next page. So she's making the point that while a circle as a design element is static and leads nowhere, if you take that circle 
and you break it in half, you've got an S. Now we know an S is a great design motif in terms of composition because it brings your eye to almost every corner of what you're looking at. Whether the whole composition breaks down to an S or smaller ones, scrolls like what she's describing, uh, whether they're very, very long or whether they're very, very tight, an S motif is a mutation of a circle, but unlike a circle being as static as it is, once you break it into twos and start experimenting with the S motif, it's limitless, right? It's limitless. They could even go in uh, slightly different directions. You know, they don't even have to sit on top of each other. She makes a lot of good points like this that really make you think. Um, and she's talking about the curved line in general and saying how in other cultures, elaborate designs, um, if, if you think like Greek, like Grecian pillars, if you think uh, Hindu or Persian or uh, Moorish or Arabian, Japanese ornamentation, these all lean heavily on a scroll, never a circle, but a scroll, including a paisley, right? That's like a mutation of a circle that's got that scroll feel to it. But she's saying as soon as you stretch out a curved line, we're, we're talking about very sort of old and historic design um, motifs. So that to me was a really interesting thought in and of itself. And then on the next page, she's showing you her idea of what rhythm patterns are that she's taken from old Japanese prints. Again, this book is 1953. So older than 1953, Japanese prints and designs. And you probably, if you're a quilter, recognize these kinds of motifs. Um, you know, a lot of fabrics are done in these designs now. But you see what she's saying? Even with that circle, you see she's done something with that circle that has almost a, Celt a Celtic feel. But you see in the background, she's showing you variations on a curve that are not a circle. And you see just from these very few examples how infinite this could be if you sat down for an hour this afternoon and just played with curves, right? Curves. Thank you, Tina. I always, um, I always get glasses from Peepers. They're always having sales. Um, Peepers is an online store. They're, they're in a lot of shops, too. Um, but they're reading glasses, and they're having a huge sale right now, $15 each. So it's good. And then you hit a certain thing. Well, I don't know if it's 35 or 50 You get a few pairs, and they ship for free. So it's really, uh, thank you. There's a million designs, and this style comes in, like, 20 colors. So I thought that was super interesting. And here comes another uh, just funny uh, anecdote, just like on Friday night. She says, a method for getting a free-flowing scroll and for creating rug design uh, in general is suggested by, get ready for this name, this is an old-timey one, Claretta Higgins of Orleans Cape Cod. Now, I googled Claretta Higgins, and there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing. Her legacy is not, it's gone. It's not on the internet. I hate it when this happens. Uh, I just wish that I knew, because she obviously was a, a rug hooker of some, you know, renown. Uh, this author was aware of her. So I wish that I could see anything that she hooked, particularly if she was also a designer and was experimenting with scrolls and uh, elongated curves. I would love to see any of her designs. Uh, but in any case, Claretta Higgins of Orleans Cape Cod said, quote, let yourself go. That's a good song, too. Uh, is, is the advice this artist designer who believes that freedom of movement is best attained by getting down on the floor and practicing long rhythmic lines on a large piece of wrapping paper, and by that I think she means like brown paper, using colored chalk. It rubs off easily, so in other words, it functions like a, like a chalkboard, leaving a clear surface to try again. The position, the feeling of the space, the chalk as an implement, all contribute to, release, to the release of tension, so to relax you, uh, in the building of confidence in one's own ability to create. I think this idea is fantastic. This reminds me, do you remember the cocktail night episode when we talked about George Wells of Long Island? Uh, his punch company, the Wells Rugs, um, that beautiful picture of him as a young man in the sand with a giant kind of a hiking stick drawing rug designs in the sand. I love the sort of temporary um, quality of designing this way. And I love the idea, particularly for a woman to say, you know, 1953, she's not going to say, get down and do some yoga while you're down there. But she's saying, what a great, you know, feeling it is for your uh, body, for your mind, to just get down on the floor with these very tactile chalks, with a piece of um, wrapping paper. Again, I think it's the brown wrapping paper like you would get in those days with everything you bought. 
uh, and just do stuff and just wipe it off with your hand if it's not working out and then do more stuff. What a great way to design, right? What a great liberating way to design. So then she goes on to say, um, real specifically, because if you think about what designs look in the middle 20th century, uh, not just Promagown, gown, um, but if you think back to Garrett Designs and Heritage Designs and other big design companies at that time uh, that had, had been designing, we're looking at a lot of florals and scrolls with like a central motif. So she says, in organizing a center medallion, have the large flowers such as roses grouped in the center for weight. This is a good thing to think about where the weight of the composition is. Cut smaller blossoms from paper to scatter about. Now this goes back to what we were talking about Friday night where the other author said, get either fabric from the store, like, you know, toile or whatever, cut motifs out, baskets, flowers, trace them onto your composition. She's basically saying the same thing. Find pictures of flowers or draw pictures of flowers, cut them out of magazines, and just trace around them and fill them in because you're not going to turn it into a photo realism masterpiece. You're going to trace around them. You're probably going to end up uh, hooking them in a very graphic style. So it doesn't matter if all the detail is there or not. What you're going to end up with is a beautiful line drawing that's very shape driven, but that gives you enough information to start your hooking. So she says, cut out the smaller blossoms, blossoms scatter them about. A pleasing type of floral is the Victorian where all four corners are alike, but the center medallion is asymmetrical. Now, I think that's a great tip for anybody that's interested in design. If you have your four corners weighted, picture yourself sitting on a picnic blanket waiting for the band concert to start on the Village Green, you're going to have a rock on all four corners of your blanket, then it doesn't really matter what you put in the middle because it's anchored down. That's a metaphor, of course, um, but I think it's a good one. Um, you know, you can do something very asymmetrical in the middle because you've already anchored for weight. The weight is on the four corners, and that's a really good start in terms of composition and design. She says, floral American rugs in the Georgian late colonial and Victorian homes, she has that in the wrong order, late colonial Georgian and Victorian homes, were the most, or for the most part, patterned after needlepoint rugs of England and imported carpets. Now, I'm reiterating because we've said this on many um, coffee times, but it's so true, isn't it? It's important uh, to keep that one in the front. So she's saying, you know, the designs that you're seeing from earlier rugs of that period, pre 20th century rugs, what you're seeing are designs that are basically copies of uh, Brussels rugs, uh, uh, sub sub rugs, and Aubusson rugs rugs that already existed, even oriental rugs, right? Rugs that already existed, people copying them uh, because the designs are already known, cer certainly the character and the feel of the rug is known. And sometimes it's easier for someone that does not have a ton of confidence in their design ability, um, but also maybe just doesn't care about that part, the designing part. Um, it's gonna be much easier to copy a design or be inspired by a design that already exists uh, than starting from scratch and cutting flowers out of fabric. Different things for different people, right? So she says, um, thus the designs tend to be more asymmetrical with free flowing lines um, on these earlier rugs, right? They've anchored the corners typically with uh, corner motifs or some kind of a oval border. So um, the inside doesn't have to be perfectly symmetrical because the outside is. There's balance already and equal weight distribution. But she says in contrast, um, sh um, I'm paraphrasing, but later on when we talk about in, in the 1950s, they're calling these kinds of designs peasant designs, the, kind, the, the ones I'm about to name, um, Penn Dutch, German design, I'm going to add Scandinavian design. They're referring to that category of design as peasant designs. These will be perfectly symmetrical because they're typically done by folding your paper in half and doing a perfectly balanced symmetrical composition on both halves, like paper cutting. These are very paper, that's, that's, the, that's the method of making the design. So these kinds of designs really fly in the face of what came before, which was the heavy floral medallion style rug with a border and a slightly asymmetrical middle. For example, three flowers, five flowers, usually not two. Although I'm sitting in front of a rug that has two. This one here, let's see if I can show you. Oh no, that one has three, what am I saying? What am I saying? That one has three right behind me, those three red roses. One of the rugs in this room has two. Oh, I missed some comments. Love that design tip. Reminds me of Zentangle, exactly. Ralda, that's exactly what it's exactly like. 
um, I get the visual of being part of the design uh, done on a large piece of paper and drawing, yep, and done with this line drawing with a marker, amazing what comes about. It's so true. You know, that idea of just sitting down on the floor with an oversized piece of paper, uh, Arabian rugs, all that stuff, all different kinds of textiles. Um, so she's saying beautiful shawls, rugs from India, Turkey, Persia, Arabia, paisley shawls from Scotland, also like um, Empire, you know, 1820s era, Jane Austen era uh, Persian shawls that would come from like Kashmir or something like that, the really expensive imported ones that people will continue to hook with even though they are so hard to hook with, they atomize in your hand, but they give you a result like nothing else and it's worth it. All of these things, all of these garments provide inspiration for someone that doesn't have commercial patterns around them, for someone who just wants to make a rug and is trying to think of what a good design might be. Museum tapestries of Persian, Flemish, or Scandinavian origin are worthy of study. She says, this illustration shows a tapestry from Finland worked up into a hooked rug design. I'm going to show it to you. Um, this, again, is it's, uh, a hooked rug pattern inspired by a tapestry from Finland. Now, if you look at this design, you see the sort of diagonal border, super easy. You see they've broken it up into octagons. So first squares, just squares, then you lop off the corners, and then you've got eight octagons. Easy peasy. You could equally have 12 or more. Uh, and you put a different little flower motif. And these flower motifs honestly look like they're from cruel embroidery, right? Uh, C-R-E-W-E-L, cruel embroidery. Very simple, just shapes, like a silhouette. And then around them, I don't, maybe they couldn't think of what to do next, but you know what? Doing this kind of hit or miss striping around the flower design is perfect, isn't it? And then they repeated that in the border. What a nice old pattern, right? From a Finnish tapestry design. What a nice old pattern. Just broken up into squares, lop off the corners, and now you've got like, you've got an octagon shape. Um, you, there's so many things that you can do with these designs. Many of these kinds of designs that you see that are early, even early 20th century, they will be handmade. These were so easy to do. People thought nothing. Remember what we said yesterday about people just being generally more capable then? They would think nothing of just getting down and designing something like this themselves. Super easy peasy. So um, that was another idea. And then she goes on to say another rug uh, pattern I'm not sure if she did it or someone else did it. It's called Ipswich Petticoat. Ipswich is the town that Ralph Burnham is from, right, um, in Cape Ann, Mass. Ipswich Petticoat. And she says uh, it's a drawing that was created based on a cruel work petticoat. So in other words, not like a hidden petticoat, like an undergarment. It would be like the overskirt that you would put over the undergarment. And that would be embroidered with cruel back in the day, if, if you had the wealth and the money or somebody to pay. But it was a cruel work uh, skirt. And it was in the collection of the Boston Museum. And um, this, this uh, rug hooking pattern came directly from that skirt. This is called Ipswich Petticoat adapted from an embroidered petticoat at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, this one here. I mean, how neat is that? I just think that is just such a cool design. Just straight from the skirt onto the burlap, right? Um, oh, it reminds me of Matisse, too, getting down and just doing shapes, cutting paper. I mean, that's what Matisse did, right? A, a whole period of his career was spent cutting paper and doing collage. Um, that's where we get all those crazy loose jigsaws, you know, and, and they speak to you. There's something about them that speak to you that I think the imperfection, um, you know, I think just that moment in time, the vivid color, it, re it really obviously speaks to people. Otherwise, he would not have become as famous uh, as he has or as enduring. Hey, Holly, loving all these ideas in history. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, I'm so glad you're there, too. But I was looking at designs like this that were also done from... Um, you know, uh, embroideries, right? You could easily see this being a table runner. Having lived and be, been born in the Netherlands, this is like a real typical kind of thing that you would find. And what they're doing here is alternating different blocks, right? You've got embroidery in one and then more of a shape thing in the next. And you're alternating them. So half of it's busy and half of it's not. Balance, equal distribution of weight. Um, so that's an important motif. The, the rug that I used of Naomi's has that idea. It's like that checkerboard material where uh, half of it is weighted on a more sort of solid hit or miss, and the other half it has like pictorial images of, of flowers. So that's the exact same principle. That's why I wanted to use that one. 
She says, when there is much detail in design and drawing around cutouts, meaning you've cut them out already and placed them down Matisse style, uh, around cutouts, um, oh, wait a minute, does not seem practical. When there is, okay, so she's saying when you cut stuff out and put it down, don't put tons of designs immediately around them. That go, I hope that goes without being said. You know, when you put down your central motif, for example, this, you're not going to make a lot of crazy business around there because the, that, that central motif of the basket is going to get lost, right? So she's saying once you do your cutouts and you lay them down the way you want them, um, if it's busy, then keep it, keep it pretty neutral and quiet and tame around the central motifs. Let the central motifs shine. Uh, let them be central, right? So she's saying, draw the design in all its detail on wrapping paper again, then trace the design on thin tracing paper from the stationers, if only, right? All of our Hallmark stores are closed, and I don't think they ever carried uh, tracing paper in my lifetime. And she says, then using crayon uh, and marking heavily, place the tracing paper on the burlap, crayon side down, you can see where this is going, and press it with a hot iron. In other words, she's got she's tr she's put her pieces down the way that she likes them. She's traced them with a crayon onto tracing paper. She's got the tra the crayon um, side down like like the sulky transfer pen, right? Crayon face down on the burlap, and she's going to hit it with a hot iron. I have not tried this technique. I wonder if if this is a known thing because I did not know this technique. I wonder if it depends on the content of actual wax or uh, if the crayon matters. But I just was blown away by this when I read it. The pattern will be imprinted clearly on the burlap. To get more than one impression, go over the design each time with crayon. Do not use ordinary wax crayons and do not use anything but regular tracing paper if you want a clear pattern. Buy a special jumbo crayons used by shippers in either red, blue, or black. So I wonder if she's talking about that kind of a pencil. Remember that had a string attached to it? And you pull the string down, and it like unscrolled, uh, and it left like that big waxy center. I wonder if that's the kind of crayon she's talking about. I welcome feedback. If anybody has the time to try this experiment, I might try it for a video. I thought it was so charming, just the talk of it. And it's certainly, talking about crayons certainly reminded me of, I hope you've had this experience as a child, being in school. Of course, I went to a Catholic school, and it was a, it was a little crazy <laughs> retrospect uh, compared to now. But, you know, we would collect all the leaves from outside, like out in the rectory yard and stuff. It was right out the door. And then we would shave our crayons with the pencil sharpener, you know. Uh, we'd each have a pencil sharpener. We'd shave the crayons and we'd put them between two pieces of wax paper. And then we would pass the iron around the classroom and iron them. I never got burnt, Mom, but I'm, I'm sure other people did. I'll have to ask some of my buddies who I'm still friends with, but that just sounds crazy to me nowadays. But that idea of um, melting melting um, wax just brought me right back there to the classroom with the leaves and the shavings of crayon. What, it's still a fun project to do with kids, um, but it brought me right back there. I think I might have to try that one for a video and just see how it goes. There are certainly more efficient transfer methods uh, at this point, but isn't it sometimes fun to do something from another time? Um, I, would I would love to try that, just 1953 style transfer method. But um, certainly, even if you don't transfer that way, the idea of cutting shapes out, putting them down in a composition, tracing them over tracing paper, you could then get a sulky, S-U-L-K-Y pen, transfer pen, sulky transfer pen from Amazon, trace it the same way she's describing as the pencil. It's actually the same thing. You have to trace it in reverse, put it down face down, ink face down on whatever backing fabric you have, including linen, hit it with the iron same way, and it's going to transfer your design really well. It's a great transfer method. But anyway, those are some funny ideas to start us off in this great book. Martha says, I've done the same thing uh, with a charcoal pencil and tracing paper. Interesting. I turn over the design and press charcoal into the backing. Then I go over the lines with a Sharpie. OK, great. That's another great method. Isn't this great? I just I just love this. Jennifer, we did the crayon iron thing too. No injuries that I remember. It was universal, I guess. It's so crazy. Kirsten says, seems like the wax would melt when steaming and possibly stain your fabric, uh, even over time. You know, that's a good point. Um, even I'm thinking of that black crayon that I think she means that you pull the string down and it get and it gets sharper. Um, I'm thinking also that does have potential to, um, if not if not stain over time or whatever, 
it has potential to be really dirty when you're pulling your strips through this. I would think the chance of getting color on your strips near the lines would be quite high. I might give it a try. These are all curious things to think about. Um, Raldis says, I've done something similar. Doing batik, oh, that's right. With Yeah, doing batik with like wax crayons. It was the only way I had to get the wax on the cloth, and it worked. Okay, that is awesome. And, you know, they do, of course, sell like wax crayons for Easter, right? It's the right time. Oh, my gosh. It's the right time of the year to get uh, wax crayons, right? Because all the PAS, P-A-A-S stuff is out in the stores right now, including the wax crayons. Interesting. I remember doing leaves. You still do it. That is so nice. I'm, I'm glad I thought of that. And I'm glad if you did it that you, that, that memory came back to you because it's such a happy one. Amber, we did crayon iron, iron too on T-shirts when we were kids. How fun. Oh, oh God, I'm now remembering iron-ons in general, just putting something on a T-shirt and proudly wearing it until you washed it one time and then it was decimated. Those were, those were funny days, the 70s and 80s. It was a great coffee time. It was great being with you. I love all your ideas. You can always send me messages if you didn't type here or you have trouble commenting. Um, yeah, I, th I think that just that one chapter um, brought up so many interesting technical ideas about approaching a design and the transfer methods. Um, whether you're going to, you know, do stuff with crayon or not, do think about that idea that the first woman gave. Uh, what was it, Clarissa um, Higgins? Something? No, it was a, it was it was more than that. More. Um, the idea that she had of getting down to the ground, even in your driveway, with chalks and trying to work out some designs. You could always take a picture with the camera with your phone afterward if you feel like you hit it, like you got that magic thing going. What a great way to design. What a great way to be outside and be crazy, right in front of the neighbors, right? Why not? So lots of good ideas there. Have a great day. Um, I, will, I will be on Zoom tomorrow. Again, look for that info on Thursday. I'll be with Naomi at her place. Uh, and we'll be talking about her work, her designs, all the stuff that she sells. Uh, and then Friday, Michelle Micarelli, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for an evening with Michelle Micarelli during our cocktail time. Have a great day. I will see you either tomorrow on Zoom or I will see you on Thursday from uh, Naomi's uh, for regular coffee time, 1130 Eastern Standard Time. Have a great day. I'm going to sit for a minute and write it out, the delay. Have a great day. I will see you soon regardless. Mm -hmm.